Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar uh, this month. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, also known as CSIAC. Um, CSIAC is one of three IA domains in the DOD Information Analysis Center, which operates under DTIC, uh, the Defense Technical Information Center. Um, our webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for us to accelerate DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. Um, CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends throughout the, the cybersecurity information system science and technology community. Um, we provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, academia, as well as stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. Um, we hope that you guys enjoy this, this webinar today, um, and it helps foster collaboration. Uh, before we get started today, I just want to point out a couple of administrative items. First, if you're dialing by phone and you would like a copy of these slides, they are actually posted to the CSI webinar announcement. Uh, you can also go to our website, csiac.org. Uh, forward slash webinars to find today's webinar. Uh, when you click on it, at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, uh, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can chat with each other, and I will be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, if you'd like to pose a question for our question and answer session, uh, which will be at the end, uh, please use the audience questions tool, which is at the top center of your screen. Uh, that icon looks like a little chat bubble, and that's next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, we'll hold all questions for the end. That's when I'll go over the uh, question and answers. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who are dialed in on the phone, I will read the question out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have a technical issue during the presentation, uh, please don't worry about it. The full presentation will be available online. Um, check back to the CSI website. Um, and once the webinar is posted, uh, the go to webinar button will take you to a YouTube link, which has uh, the recording available. Um, with that said, that I'm done with the in introductions. I will now hand it over to our presenters today. Um, I believe I'll be handing it off to Michael Harpin from the Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency. Awesome. Thanks, Philip. So uh, I'm Michael Harkin. I'm from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Let me share the camera. Let everyone know I'm actually here. Um, I'm the federal lead for the President's Cup Cybersecurity Competition. And with me today is Matt Carr from the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Matt is the SEI lead for the President's Cup. Uh, really excited to talk to this audience today about the President's Cup. Um, uh, so let's just get started. The President's Cup is a competition that's open only to federal employees. So today we're going to talk about how it got stood up, uh, what went into the holding the first uh, competition, uh, some lessons learned we've had over the years and, and the outlook for the competition. And at the end, talking about how we're putting together the, the challenges and applications we use for the competition and releasing those to the public. So uh, in the spring of 2019, Executive Order 13870 on America's Cybersecurity Workforce mandated that DHS hold the competition annually. The goal of the competition is to identify and recognize the best cybersecurity talent within the federal workforce. Uh, it is open to only federal employees, not contractors. So any employee of any, any federal department or agency, including uniformed personnel, can participate in the competition. It is the only competition held across the federal government. Uh, there are competitions held internally to other departments and agencies. Uh, this is the only one that spreads across. And last year and this year, we had 19 different um, agencies participate in the competition. I included a graphic here um, that shows the 2020 winners. 
I think this is a mostly DOD audience, so you'll be happy to see that all the winners were from the DOD last year. Um, but they did come from different branches and just sharing that to, to show that the competition is, is open across the federal government. The competition has an individual and teams track. Uh, the teams are made up of two to five members, all from the same department. So you don't have a FBI and CISA personnel on the same team, but you can have CISA personnel from across the agency all participating as one team. The competition is a capture the flag format. Uh, so if people aren't familiar with that, uh, within each challenge, you find a, a token and submit those as an answer uh, to receive points. Those tokens can be anything from a username that may have uh, committed some malicious activity or, or a hash value, and you'll submit those again to, to get the points for the, for the challenge. There are three rounds in the President's Cup, two qualifying rounds and the finals. Uh, right now, actually, we're in the middle of our uh, between round one and round two of the 2021 competition. Um, the qualifying rounds, first round, open to anybody within the federal government who is interested. Uh, they verify their uh, federal employment with a .gov or .mil e email address. And from the first round, we take uh, the top teams from each department. There are some departments that only have one team, and those teams do automatically qualify for the second round, and plus the tw top 20% of uh, the scores. And for individuals, we take the top 100 scores with no tiebreakers. So if there are from, round, from 100 to 125, all the same score, they all make it into round two. And for the final round, uh, we take the top five teams, um, and we take the top 10 individuals from each track. I'll talk about how the tracks are, are separated uh, in a couple slides. The team's competition is split up into two days. Um, the, the first day follows a similar format as the qualifying rounds. The second day features a video game that's built just for the, the finals. That's also live streamed on YouTube. Um, you can catch the, you can review some of the previous live streams that are still available on CISA's YouTube page. We, we did that in response to the executive order, which asked that we had observers uh, in the finals. Um, and it really incorporates that non-federal participation into the finals. Um, last year, we, we have a challenge that it, uh, surrounded ransomware on a 911 system. And after the competition, we were reached out by a uh, CIO from a major city wanting to understand more of how the, kind of the challenge was solved, what could be potentially used for training. Uh, a real great success story for us in being able to reach the public and how we are making our competition a, a real world type of event. Um, the live stream also lets us highlight the, the skill sets within our participants. Um, we want to give them that opportunity. We don't share names unless it's cleared, um, but we do get to show how they go through challenges. Um, and me personally, just makes me feel better that we have these guys within the federal government. Along with the competition, we have other content in the live stream, uh, interviews with members of the cybersecurity workforce from CISA and across the federal government, keynote speakers, uh, which I'll talk more about a little, in a little bit, and how to solve some of the challenges, just to name some of the content within there. And that all kind of gets back to what can we provide back to the public uh, with what we're holding with the competition. When we were standing up the competition, we had to submit a plan to the White House uh, in response to the executive order. And one of the requirements we had was how can we make the competition uh, accessible uh, to, to anyone and scalable to support all the participants we were expecting. We wanted to have the challenge accessible without any hardware or software requirements, downloading anything by the participants. We understood many participants are going to use their government furnished laptops or equipment to participate. The top, the, the, the top contenders and participants, maybe not, but we want to make sure that we're, we're inclusive of everybody. Um, so we made it so that only a standard, web, you could access the competition only through a standard web browser. And we made it so that it's scalable to, to host thousands of concurrent participants at a time. 
And uh, through our, our round one we had previously, uh, we, we, we had that level of participation, uh, which we are excited to see. So in order to do that, uh, we use tools brought by SEI, uh, Topo Mojo, which allows a quick deployment of small virtual machines for the hosted challenges. The game board and identity applications were, were built as products for the President's Cup. And the game board um, is to manage the scoring and, and run a competition on top of Tobo Mojo and identity uh, to, to manage authentication. So the pres with those tools, the President's Cup is unique in that we can um, deploy our challenges within dynamic virtual machines. And then the platform can be run entirely in the cloud on VMware hypervisors. And this allows us to meet those requirements that we had for being accessible and being scalable. One of the requirements of the executive order was that we tie the, the competition to the NICE framework. So for each challenge, we tie that to a NICE work role and, and task. This lets us build a well-rounded competition uh, not focusing on one skill set or or one work role, not just forensics, but everything. Uh, and it's worked out very well for us in the competition. The challenges are built within Topo Mojo, which I mentioned earlier. And the developers will create the virtual machines with pre-made templates. They write the challenge instructions that are displayed to the challenge to the participants of the competition. And they'll write out the uh, questions and the, ex the answers that we expect for the, for the challenge. We create multiple variants for each challenge to limit sharing of answers. Uh, and those are randomized when launched by the participants. We also have some infinity challenges where the var variants are randomized by Topo Mojo. So the hash value or the token, uh, the, those values are randomized again to, to limit and help us against sharing of answers. The executive order also um, called for the participation uh, or partnership with DOE. So our challenges are run through quality assurance and play tested by members of the national labs in partnership with DOE. So they bring their subject matter expertise and run through each of our challenges. We score them based on percentage of people we expect to solve the challenges, uh, time to solve and difficulty. And this allows us to give fair scoring to each of the challenges, uh, as well as determine which round the challenges are going to be used in. A big part of the competition is our session timer. In 2021, it was four hours for individuals and eight for teams. This is a continuous timer that it cannot be stopped. So once a competitor starts the competition, that window, that time window is started uh, and they have to complete as many the challenges within that four hour time limit or eight hours as teams. So for example, this year, uh, our round one would start on a Monday morning, ends on the following Monday night for eight days. The competitors have that time window to start their, their timer. Um, the eight hours is difficult to coordinate with, with the team members. And when we put out the messaging for the competition, we highly encourage uh, the federal cybersecurity leaders to allow their employees to play and participate during work hours. We've been encouraged to see that uh, more and more with each year of the competition because of the recognition uh, not only the participants get from performing well, but also their department and their division uh, and, and their performance. So the session timer has helped us it level the playing field as well. Uh, I can speak from experience with children on, on weekends, don't have much time. Uh, and so we don't want to give an advantage to individuals who might be able to put forth a lot of personal time into the competition and it highly influences how we may develop our challenges, knowing we have that limited time, and it and it uh, also influences the strategy of the competitors with taking on the competition. So in 2019, we had our inaugural event. We had two tracks with the teams and individuals. Uh, we have the game show style board here used in the in the qualifying rounds. Um, again, tied to the nice cybersecurity workforce and the, and the uh, framework and the work roles within there. Our final round we hosted in, the, in Arlington, Virginia um, at, with the CISA facilities. We had a 3D immersive escape room challenge, which was very exciting. Um, and hopefully we're hoping to get back to a time where we can uh, host, the host the finals again in person. Board 
one. There we go. Uh, in 2020, we took some feedback from our participants and, oh, it delayed on me. There we go. Uh, and we had multi-part challenges uh, that could give us partial credit. So in 2019, it was kind of all or nothing with the challenges this time, but now we had multiple um, parts within the challenge and we still carry that on for the 2021 competition. We split up the individual competition into two tracks for incident, one for incident response and forensics, the other for vulnerability analysis and exploitation. We were hoping that by splitting it up, um, we, we would allow participants with different skill sets to, to be recognized. We did see that. We saw the, the top three finishers in each um, track were different, but we did have individuals who qualified for finals in both. I think that just speaks to the skill set and knowledge that those individuals had. Uh, like everything else in the, in the world in 2020, we uh, had to move our finals to be uh, virtual and held remotely. We delayed the finals a um, couple months to in order to test out and, and figure out a way to to host the competition remotely and keep that minimum hardware and software requirements on the participants. To in order for the participants to 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 access the game client, we had to procure cloud GPU enabled VMs. So it was a big big lift on us, but there were positives. Uh, we we had the remote monitoring of our competitor VMs during the competition. And this had two positives for us. One, that during the live stream, we could show split screens, show the action, uh, give it more of like an e-gaming type of a vibe uh, and let people see all the activity that the participants are going through in the finals. And it also really increased our communication and coordination with the developers of the challenges uh, if any issues come up. So no competition is going to be held without any hiccups. If there are some questions or issues that come up, this allowed us to quickly coordinate with everyone and get a good feedback back to our participants in order to mitigate the issue. So within two, two years, our reputation has grown for the competition. Uh, in 2019, our award ceremony was held in person, probably one of the last things we got to do uh, in person before the pandemic. Uh, at the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, and Vice President Pence was the keynote speaker. Last year in our live stream, a few weeks after being sworn in, uh, the Secretary, DHS Secretary Mayorkas appeared on our live stream uh, to give some remarks regarding his cybersecurity outlook. Uh, very, very exciting for the competition. And last year in our awards ceremony held virtually, uh, Ann Newberger, the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology was our keynote speaker. Again, really building the reputation of the competition and, and excited to build on that in our third year. It's delay on me again. There we go. So I mentioned before, we are uh, in the middle of our 2021 competition. Round two, the team's competition starts on, on Monday, this coming Monday, October 18th. We've continued using the same nice work roles uh, for our teams and individual tracks. We had some updates to our game board. Uh, which Matt's going to walk through for us later. And we have a new finals video game that we're using in day two of the team's competition. So here's my plug out to this audience. Uh, on December 9th is going to be our live stream uh, for the 2021 competition. And please continue to check cisa.gov slash President's Cup for any information on that going forward. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matt Carr. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, on, on this slide, we're talking about uh, what we did software wise in, uh, uh, for, the, for this most recent competition that's currently ongoing. Um, again, uh, just wanted to uh, introduce myself quickly. Uh, I'm uh, Matt Carr from the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I'm uh, the uh, lead for our support to the President's Cup cybersecurity competition. And I also serve as an adjunct instructor at the Information Networking Institute there on campus. Um, as far as uh, our support to the President's Cup, we've been at it for, this is now our, our third year. Uh, we've uh, contributed uh, planning, software development, execution, 
and uh, you know, and, and uh, wrap up for the competition uh, each of those years. And uh, we're excited to be a part of it. Uh, it was uh, an, an honor to be selected to help put together the competition. And we've continued to iterate and take lessons learned, feedback from our competitors, et cetera, to make uh, the competition better every year. So uh, with this year, uh, we, we uh, did a number of things. Um, one was to uh, take the game board application that the slide talks to and, uh, and, and uh, integrate it so that there's one application that oversees all of the challenge runs. So uh, uh, every time uh, we create a different board for a different track of the competition, that all gets uh, put into a single game board application now. Uh, we're also... Uh, we also put uh, the challenge um, metadata right there in the application, and we uh, took some email uh, functionality out of this and moved it over to the identity server where it makes more sense because it's closer to where that uh, PII for our uh, competitors is stored. So uh, just cleaning up uh, those interfaces to make sure we're in compliance with, with all the needed security uh, protocols uh, regarding the competition. So um, with that, I wanted to do a quick demo uh, to kind of show off what this looks like. Uh, I will share and see if this will work. And I hope that you all can see my screen and uh, getting the thumbs up that I can, that you all can see the uh, President's Cup uh, website here. So if you go to presidentscup.cisa.gov, uh, this is the landing page for the competition. This is where competitors go uh, when they're deciding what track they're going to compete in. Um, we've got uh, uh, three different tracks this year. We have a teams competition, uh, which takes place uh, during uh, a certain set of weeks uh, with the um, qualifying rounds and, and the final round. And then uh, separately, there's an individual competition that takes place during a different set of weeks. And one thing we started uh, that Michael already mentioned last year is we uh, split up that competition into two tracks, track A uh, and track B. Track A focused on incident response and forensics, track B uh, being more uh, exploitation, phone assessment, uh, et cetera. And so this is where you go to kind of find your way on what you'd like to participate in. Uh, you are not restricted in any way from keep competing in all of the tracks. And in fact, we had a number of competitors last year that uh, that uh, that qualified in the finals for all three uh, tracks, and and uh, and that was that's pretty amazing uh, considering the competition. So what I wanted to show off now was kind of what this game board application looks like, um, and uh, for that I'm going to just jump in here. Um, I've got a we've there's a practice board that's available to all participants in the competition to try out their systems to make sure this works. Now one of the things that is important to President's Cup, as uh, Michael already mentioned, is this uh, is the session timer, this uh, period of time that you have to, comp uh, to compete uh, in each round. So if the round window lasts eight days, you have uh, eight hours within uh, one of those days to, uh, to actually compete. So for the practice board, it's set to one hour, but it still gives you the same sense of, you know, uh, time scarcity, if you will. Uh, to complete uh, your round. So, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start my, uh, and you can see there, uh, my, uh, my name is uh, Delicate Flower. That's a, uh, that's a uh, inside joke that uh, we have on the team. Um, I, uh, I have a couple of things that I can look at here as far as status. I can change my display name if I want to, and then some information about the round. Uh, this is a individual board, so I don't have to find any other teammates, but if I, uh, if this was a team board, then it, this would also have the mechanism to go and find my teammates. Um, oh, hold on, something happened there. I think I, there we go. Uh, I can go ahead and start my session. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, some, uh, some folks that inadvertently started their um, session. And so we've added this uh, uh, warning uh, to make sure you are super uh, sure that you want to start your timer because we uh, don't want you to uh, lose t time and and not understand that there is a, a fixed period of time. There else, there's also a video on the landing page that goes over the the uh, the timer because it is uh, 
uh, one of the things that I think makes President's Cup uh, unique in this regard. So I go ahead and confirm it. And once I do that, I can head on over to the game board. And you see there I have 59 minutes remaining. And from here, I can go ahead and select a challenge. Um, you wouldn't see this variant uh, selector here as a normal participant, but this is something we use with testing where we can uh, launch different variants. Um, and because I'm logged in with an administrative account right now, it does give me the ability to change that. Um, and then I go ahead and start the challenge. And this challenge deploys in under 20 seconds. And this is something I think is worth mentioning um, that is very important to a timed competition is if you were to uh, burden the competitors with downloading virtual machines, running them on their own hardware, doing all this stuff on their own, one, you'd have to have much higher system requirements to complete to compete in the competition. And uh, it would have a hard time offering it out as a timed event because of the variation in, in what people's bandwidth, et cetera. So that's, I think, another uh, reason why we went with a hosted model. It also allows us to create much richer networked environments for, uh, for uh, offering out challenges. In this case, you have a pretty simple flat network with two systems, a Kali workstation and a Windows 10. Ooh. What's going on there? Oh, of course. There we go with live demos. All right, well, I've got another uh, option here. I'm not cer certain exactly what's going on there, uh, but I won't belabor it while I'm... Oh, you know what? I think I just had a... My token probably expired there. Let me try one more time. All right, sweet. All right, cool. So uh, so with that, you have, a, uh, um, you, you have the ability to launch these consoles, and I can go and launch a Kali workstation or a Windows 10 workstation. And these are ready built environments that have all the tools needed to solve the challenges. Again, these are the same environments used by our quality assurance teams and, uh, and all of the run throughs in the testing phase uh, to get to these, uh, get to the answer. And so uh, right there, you, you know you have everything. You don't have to bother going and downloading software, finding other things. Uh, these are uh, ready built and uh, the tools are already there. So uh, I kind of uh, breeze through it, but uh, back here, you've got some description on uh, what nice task uh, this uh, relates to the nice work role um, that is represented by this challenge, and then some descriptive text and, and uh, the setting the scenario. So this is a pretty small sample challenge. This isn't really uh, getting at a lot of deep cyber uh, techniques. This is more just trying to acclimate the competitors into this environment, make sure their system works, there's no latency or, uh, uh, or no, no severe latency, and, um, and being able to operate within this environment. So um, that's that. And, uh, and at, then as we go down here, uh, this is kind of what drives your, uh, your analysis, how you approach the challenge, uh, are these challenge questions. So uh, in here, you've got three ch questions. These are worth varying number of points. Uh, but they this, they sum up to uh, 100, and uh, this gives you uh, kind of the the basis for you know how you're going to answer the challenge. You've got these uh, these questions to answer. Now, uh, one other thing we have with the President's Cup is a limited number of submissions. So instead of just continuing to uh, submit answers until you might stumble across the correct one, you actually have to come up with what you think is the correct answer, and you've got three tries to answer this. So if I go in and I was to say, uh, answer a few, and I'm just uh, throwing in some answers here just for the purposes of demonstration, um, you can see here, I didn't get any of this right, and now I've got two of three left. So this is a useful, uh, um, a, a useful approach. Now with that, uh, I think we've kind of gone over uh, game board to the extent I want to. I know we want to save some time at the end to talk through the uh, uh, the open sourcing uh, work that we've done. So with that, I will stop sharing and hand it back to Michael. All right. Oh, look at that right there. Great. Thanks, Matt. So what's, we've had the competition now for two years in our third 
And what's what's our what's our plan for the President's Cup going forward? We have this library of challenges that we've now built for the President's Cup. And what can we do with it besides making uh, the, the the very cool challenge and competition for, for the participants? One aspect of that we want to do going forward is, is holding additional competitions uh, internal to the federal workforce. Um, potentially a smaller scope as, a, as opposed to the whole workforce. Um, maybe identifying a lower skill level. You know, we are trying to identify the best of the best here. Uh, is, is, there a different, is there a different skill level that we can target in these competitions? Um, we also want to ease the intimidation factor by making these things available. And myself personally, I, I finished in the, the bottom 10 percentile of the competition, and we've gotten that feedback before from some other individuals in the federal workforce that they don't want to join, finished at last, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we want to we want to show them it's not super difficult. We're giving them this great training opportunity as well within the President's Cup, uh, and and they, we we want to encourage that participation and get the whole federal workforce uh, if we can. We also want to make these challenges available uh, for education and training of the federal federal workforce. So here on the right, I'm showing our our from the practice area, and Matt just clicked through that on the game board. Um, right now, we are in a transition from the competition being hosted at SEI into a DHS cloud environment. We have, you can see grayed out, it says challenge archive. That's our archive site, and we're hoping to get that back, stood back up as soon as possible. And within that archive site, we were making as many of the challenges as we could uh, available permanently to, to any federal employee. Um, it was a great learning opportunity with these simulated real world environments. Uh, so we want to uh, encourage that and keep that going going forward. Um, we have been very targeted to the federal workforce. How I, might we be able to expand the, the, the competition material out uh, to contractors or to the general public? Um, uh, at Black Hat, we made some of our challenges available to the Black Hat uh, attendees uh, with the code they received by registering for the event. We want to try and do more events like that going forward, and something CISA is excited uh, to do. We also released the, the source code for the challenges after each competition. We did so after the 2019 competition and looking to do the same for the 2020 competition, which we still owe to the public, as well as the 2021 competition once it's over. That feeds into the last bullet point of the Foundry Appliance, uh, which was announced at the 2021 Black Hat. This package is all the software used for the President's Cup in a ready to use all in one environment. So we're hoping that with the source code of the challenges uh, at, with the Foundry Appliance, we can allow the, the public and other entities to hold President's Cup-like competitions. Competitions have a lot of value in education and training in giving that hands-on opportunity, as well as reaching a new part of the workforce. So the goal of the competition is to identify and recognize top talent, but how can we use it towards other sub goals that CISA has in shortening the uh, cybersecurity workforce gap and rescaling uh, other members of the federal workforce continuing education and training. And we have a lot of these great challenges. Now we want to we want to be able to focus those towards those other goals as well. So really excited about the Foundry Appliance and what it can do for the competition. Um, we also want to be able to expand as we're building out these competitions. We can't we can't rely only on SEI. And we want to be able to also expand that scope we have for the challenge developers. This year um, we had some CISA participants um, develop a challenge, some interns we had uh, that was used in the competition. Very excited about that. And how can we continue to build on that to, to, to broaden that scope, uh, as well as the skill set, subject matter expertise, and build that into President's Cup, as well as other challenges. And we're going to go back to Matt, hear more about the Foundry Appliance. Great. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so yeah, so the Foundry Appliance, uh, what is that? So we uh, we took all of the uh, President's Cup software, the, the same software that's used 
uh, in production to run the President's Cup and uh, bundled it into a single uh, virtual machine that uh, allows you to run the same software stack on your own gear uh, in whatever way you want. Uh, you can also run in the cloud if you want. We actually did that for the Black Hat deployment. We ran the same appliance out in Microsoft Azure and, uh, and, and made it available to Black Hat attendees, as Michael already said. Uh, but you, it's out published to GitHub. Uh, it builds with a uh, uh, Packer, uh, HashiCorp Packer build script, if uh, you're familiar with that tool, uh, to create a virtual machine image. And then you can just run that image wherever you'd like. So um, it does require VMware uh, hypervisors to serve the challenge environments. Uh, VMware publishes a uh, appliance so that you can use it uh, in a test capacity without have actually having your own VMware servers. But to get it to any real scale, uh, you need to have some separate hardware that would, or a cloud environment that ran uh, that ran VMware. And with that, uh, let me go ahead and share again. And. Okay, and so um, I'll pull this over to the side real quick. Okay, so uh, so this is the GitHub link that's referenced uh, there on the slide that was referenced on the slide. Uh, this is where you can go and find it uh, on CMU's uh, SEI's uh, GitHub account, and uh, this is just the you know where the actual code lives that builds the appliance. But to, in order to really get a sense of what the appliance is like, it's better if you're running one. And so I do have one running on my system here. Um, and uh, this is kind of what you see as soon as you load it up. So you go, you go to, you load it up on your local network, you go to foundry.local, which is a DNS record advertised via uh, something called multicast DNS, which uh, require, it doesn't require you to establish a separate host file or, or some kind of uh, entry uh, specific to the appliance. And then you install a certificate and uh, trust it. That's uh, th those certificates are just for the purposes of this uh, so uh, this appliance, so you don't get a bunch of browser warnings. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. You'll just get more browser warnings. Um, and then uh, and then you just go through and you scroll down and you find a bunch of applications. Each of these applications has an API, and that API is published. Uh, so if you go in, you can uh, find out what's under the hood as far as the application goes. And then you have the applications themselves. So, uh, you know, very briefly, I know we're running a little short on time, but um, Identity Server is what manages single sign-on for this platform. Uh, it's a OAuth2 and OpenID Connect compliant um, uh, identity server, and it uh, is where all of the competitor in, in the production environment, uh, production presence cup environments, where all the competitor uh, data is stored. Um, in this test environment, it just has uh, some test accounts created. You can see here, I've created a few test accounts. And also it's already configured to talk to the other app. So OpenID Connect can be a bit of a, uh, a maze to figure out uh, what, uh, how to configure. And uh, luckily the appliance comes pre-configured uh, in a working state. So that's, uh, that's very useful. Uh, going back to the appliance. Uh, next up, we have Topo Mojo. Topo Mojo is our uh, challenge and lab building environment. So this is what talks to the hypervisor and allows you to create uh, content. Uh, actually, the, the course that I teach at Carnegie Mellon uh, uses Topo Mojo for a group project uh, that we have as part of that class. And we have uh, this semester, we have 15 teams building labs inside of Topo Mojo, and the one thing they have in common is they really do not know or need to know how to use VMware proper, right? This is a user interface that abstracts a lot of that away and allows you to just work with the environment. So you see here, uh, we've got a workspace that you can go and author um, content in. You have different templates that you can add. This is a virtual machine template. If I want to load a console uh, for that virtual machine, I can go load it up. And, um, and I can add new templates if I want to. I can have a uh, challenge document that, uh, that has all of the, uh, still loading there, um, that has all of the uh, content in it. And that challenge document can be edited and, and it's actually a collaborative editor. So multiple people can edit at the same time, a la Google Docs. Um, inside the challenge tab here, uh, we have the ability to add random values 
uh, for use in the challenge solution. So uh, this is uh, uh, part of that infinity uh, challenge capability that is built in. Uh, you can create different random values and then have those injected into the into what we call the game space or the deployed instance of a workspace um, as it uh, as it comes up. And then uh, you set uh, a bunch of questions that you're going to ask uh, in your challenge, and this is where you would do that. So you, uh, if you need to have multiple variants, then you'd set it up here. But if you're doing the infinity style above, then you, you don't really have to have multiple variants because that's really taking care of the variants within the challenges. Um, you have the ability to upload ISO files. You can see here I've uploaded an Alpine Linux ISO, and I can attach that to a VM. I can drag other files in here to upload them. And I can play through my challenge in a test capacity, which is a new thing we uh, rolled out to Topomojo this year that's been really helpful for our challenge developers. And uh, with that, uh, let me go back. Just the last thing, we've already really looked at Topomojo, uh, or sorry, uh, at Gameboard. So I don't have to show you that again, but there is a working copy of Gameboard in this environment. And uh, you can go and, and tweak it however you want. You get access to the admin panel, uh, take a look at challenge reports, uh, things like that. So um, yeah, that is uh, that is the uh, run through of the appliance. Again, this is available on GitHub. And if you go to a release, you can get the actual OVA that you would use. So this is the most convenient way to, to use this, uh, to go and download it and, and, uh, and run it, is just to grab the OVA. Then you can run it inside a virtual box, uh, VMware, Parallels, whatever your hypervisor is. And uh, yeah, that is uh, about it. I haven't really looked at any questions that came up, but take a look now. And I think we're probably to the end of uh, the prepared remarks. And now we can uh, go back and uh, answer any questions. Yeah. Well, that is it uh, from us. You know, appreciate everyone attending, um, allowing us to, to spread the word about the President's Cup. Uh, we we are excited about the the the, the um, word of mouth way that it's been spreading within the, the federal government, and we're really excited to get more people involved in our live stream. And again, like I said in the outlook, how can we how can we use these challenges more, make them available to the public? All things we're continuing to work on here at CISA. So with that, happy happy to take any other questions. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, very informative, informative, very impressive uh, that you guys are able to uh, put on a competition at that scale. Um, we did get one question in the attendee chat that was answered, but uh, for the benefit of those who did not see that or who had dialed in, uh, I'll read that aloud as well. Uh, we had a question from Karu David Lee Neal who asks, are there any aspects of the challenges accessible to employees of DOD contractor companies? Um, Matt, you kind of answered that in the chat, but if you wanted to, uh, expand on that a little bit uh, for the benefit of the rest of our listeners. Yeah, yeah I can, I, go ahead, Matt, go ahead. why don't you start? Okay, yeah, just to build on the, the answer I put into chat, um, you know, we are looking to open source uh, content that has been created for uh, previous Presence Cups, as uh, Michael already mentioned, and then that coupled with the platform itself uh, we think is uh, very valuable to uh, DoD contractors as well as really anybody else uh, who has an interest in in running a competition or training environment. We actually have two um, users of the found, going back to the to the appliance. Have two users uh, out there right now that are using it in this uh, beta stage. Uh, one is at a uh, university in South Carolina who's starting up a um, uh, information security undergraduate curriculum there, and they are uh, using it in a uh, uh, for uh, for some of their classes. And separately, there's a uh, a group out at the U.S. Army Cyber School at Fort Gordon who's using it for some uh, training curriculum that they are building. Uh, so, and that that would those two uh, uh, the, our awareness of those two separate efforts uh, just came because uh, they reached out to us and. Uh, and within 60 days of us publishing it to GitHub and announcing it at Black Hat. So that was pretty cool to have such a quick uptake on that. But with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Michael. Yeah, yeah, thanks, man. That's that's kind of getting that public um, uh, partnership here with the President's Cup. 
Uh, we that's a question we get a lot is what about federal contractors participating in the event? Um, the executive order calls for it to, to recognize the, the federal workforce only. And that's that's our goal right now. How can we stand up other challenges? Uh, obviously, it's a bigger scale with the with the, including contractors. Um, but but we're, we're excited to offer our material out. Uh, I included the GitHub for the 2019 um, source code of the challenges. Uh, we do make that available. Uh, along with solution guides uh, to, to be able to walk through that. But right now, focusing on the federal workforce as far as competitions go and, and hoping that we can expand that participation in years going forward. Okay. Uh, we also have another question that was uh, posted uh, in the attendee chat as well uh, from Charles J. M. Hansis. This may have been covered earlier, but how many teams have previously participated and what is the expectation for this year? And then he also has another question. Are the National Guard Cyber Forces allowed to participate? The the second part uh, is yes. Um, you need a dot mail email address or dot gov to, to, uh, to register for the, the event. And so yes, National Guard can participate. Pulling up some numbers here. I think this is about where we go. This is the number of users. Um, I apologize. I don't have the exact number of teams who participated now. 312. There we go. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, so we have 312 teams participate, uh, and each of those, again, has, a, has up to two to five members uh, per team. And that was for this year's competition. The question was like, uh, how, how, and how is it uh, uh, compared to previous years? That's an increase, I think, above about fifty teams over what we saw last year, and uh, and then an that was an increase of some number of teams from what we saw in twenty nineteen. So it has been a steady rise uh, uh, that we've seen uh, interest wise, and I think that has, as Michael already mentioned, word of mouth is very, uh, uh, very big with this competition as people compete. Uh, they tell their friends, they, others that work within the federal government. Yeah, and through events like this, um, just spreading the word, making people aware of it. And uh, and we're really excited. We always try, it has been held in the fall. Uh, so in the 2022 competition, we're, we're expecting to start that uh, in August or September. Um, there is an election, midterm election next year, and we want to make sure we avoid any of that. So a lot of our competitors are involved in the the protection of elections. So we make sure we have a good chunk of time uh, that away from that to, to allow them to carry out that mission. Okay, so that's good. I don't see any uh, posted uh, directly uh, right now, but I do have a couple questions uh, just for uh, my own curiosity. Um, what degrees, certifications, skill sets, um, demographics would you say have excelled in the challenge so far? Are you seeing a lot of new hires? Are you seeing more senior people? Are you seeing computer engineers, computer scientists? Um, what do you what do you think uh, from a background standpoint um, has been the most successful in this in the President's Cup so far? I, I can start Matt and then you can uh, you can chime in. Um, so we, we don't collect a lot of that information on the individuals. We, we've gotten to know some of them um, so the the in person award ceremony that was held and the in person finals held in 2019 and they've carried over, um, and just in communications with them after the competitions, uh, it is a younger, I would say, a younger audience of the winners. Maybe, maybe not necessarily, um, but I but la the winner of the first year was a cadet in the Air Force Academy, right, Matt? And uh, so. Uh, that just shows you know, the, the, the age uh, scope that we have in our winners. Um, we have a lot of DOD uh, personnel who, who, who qualify for the finals and have won. Uh, I think it's just their, the nature of their work and their mission. A lot of the federal government is focused on defense, uh, rightfully so. And the, the DOD might have more of a uh exploitation and, and vulnerability part of their mission and training uh so they tend to do better uh in those areas but um i from as far as education or experience 
it's really these uh, the, the people familiar with competition so far, um, but I, I haven't heard or, or really checked in on education uh, or, or background for, for any of our winners uh, or finalists. Matt, anything to add there? No, I think you've uh, pretty well covered it. I think the competitors uh, span a uh, pretty wide range. Even on the age side, we had uh, one team of, uh, I would say, you know, older team from the Army that was there mm -hmm. in person in the 2019 uh, comp uh, competition finals. And uh, I know that some of the uh, younger competitors were uh, were ribbing them a bit about uh, how they how they made it, et cetera. But uh, I, I think it's it's uh, it's all in good fun. Um, in general, yeah, I, I think that they come from different walks and, and have found their way to uh, doing well in the competition. I, I would say uh, that the competition is grounded in federal work and federal work roles and categorizing that work uh, via uh, the uh, NICE framework, which we already mentioned. So it's, uh, it's those areas that are important that we're trying to highlight with uh, the challenges that we build uh, for the competition. Thank you. Uh, also, in one of your slides, uh, you hit on the QA for each challenge and having some of the DOD labs participate on, on that side. Um, for some of our members, for some of our subject matter experts, if they would like to participate in that fashion, um, not necessarily just competing, if they would like to kind of help mold some of the challenges, um, how would they go about doing that? Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question and, and something where we're always trying to, to open the, uh, participation in the president's cup. Um, right now in our partnership with DOE, um, they, they support that effort with the national labs to provide the, the, uh, play testing and quality assurance on the, on the challenges. It's been invaluable to the competition. Um, and, um, but plans to open that up we have um not really considered but we're hoping as the, the foundry appliance allows us to have other additional developers you know how could we potentially open that up to um other people involved in qa and play testing we're going to need it with other competitions we want to hold so that's a great question philip um should have you involved in some of our brainstorming sessions uh but uh something that we would have to lay out and, and haven't really considered yet but as the foundry appliance uh, matures we can start incorporating other personnel in, into the challenge development and the quality assurance part of the competition okay sounds good uh i still don't see any other audience questions um i'm not gonna take too much of your time uh the last thing that that i had i think you guys kind of touched on it a little bit but um, is there a STEM version or a quote unquote junior version of the President's Cup that you guys are currently running or looking to run? Um, there are a lot of other cyber competitions out, out there as you guys are well aware of um, on a much smaller scale, but is there something um, that you guys are sponsoring or attached to the President's Cup that you're looking um, to target at possibly at the collegiate or high school level over? No, thank you for that. And that, that's a big question. So right now, uh, there, there are not that, that the plans for that, set plans for the President's Cup. We want to expand the brand. Uh, and we want to use that library of challenges, which I, I've spoke about a few times. Uh, we do uh, partner with the US Cyber Games. Um, if anybody here is familiar with that, uh, we have had some conversations with them. We offered some of our challenges uh, that have downloadable content um, to that the U.S. Cyber Games effort um, for their training. I should probably explain what that the U.S. Cyber Games is. Uh, the uh, ANISA, the Cybersecurity Agency, or within the European Union, uh, they held a Europe uh, European cyber competition annually, and they wanted to expand that effort into an international competition. U.S. Cyber Games was uh, stood up uh, with a grant from NIST, and um, that was to build a U.S. team to go to the international competition. All participants had to be 18 to 26, uh, and um, we we partnered with that. 
there's National Cyber League, there's you know, the Cyber Patriot, um, uh, we, you know, the CCDC. We're in conversations with a lot of those different organizations. Uh, how can we use our material towards those? How can we participate, sponsor? Um, no set partnerships with any of those yet, but we are in constant communication with them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we did get a comment in the attendee chat. I'll just read it aloud um, for for everybody. Uh, Jared Schumann says, reserving a spot in the finals for Cyber Patriot winners would be interesting, or even for the SAN Service Cup. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and, and we're trying to incorporate, you know, those types of, that, that, that's great, you know, uh, out of the box thinking there is, is how could those participants uh, join in with with Patriots uh, the President's Cup, excuse me. Um, yeah, all things we're considering, and, and we want to incorporate that younger audience um, and a diverse audience as well. And um, it's it's talked about constantly within CISA. CISA does a great job in in being forward looking. If you've heard Director Isoli speak at all, it's how do we build the workforce? How do we get a diverse workforce within uh, cybersecurity? And, and I think competitions, my opinions of competitions are a great way to do that. Uh, and so showing our partnership with some established competitions like Cyber Patriot uh, is a great way to do that. Uh, our goal, again, federal workforce, executive order mandate of, of, of identifying and recognizing best talent within the federal workforce. We're not here to compete with all the other uh, competitions that are out there. And just want to partner with that, addressing the bigger goal of cybersecurity workforce gaps, reskilling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all options we have, and we have great support from Director Easterly in, in those areas uh, that we want to expand. Thank you. Uh, it's 1257. I think we're running up to our, our limit of our allotted time. Uh, but I would like to thank Matt and Michael. Uh, for the presentation, very informative, very interesting topic. Um, I'm as just a reminder for everybody on the line, uh, we will be posting this to our website um, as well as to the CSI YouTube channel. Uh, you will receive an email when when that is posted. Uh, so I'd like to thank you guys again, um, and that's all we have this month. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.